On today's World Insight, Trump's ban on TikTok and WeChat is the latest move in China-U.S. tensions. Can China adjust its economic strategy to overcome these actions? And people-to-people -people relations built on song and dance. Brigham Young University's long history of cultural tourism in China. What it means in a time of worsening China-U.S. tensions. People can still connect at a very deep level, even though the politics around them may be trying to divide. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei, from Beijing. We begin with the likely inward-looking shift in China's economic policy. Faced with weakened export markets amid the pandemic and a hostile United States banning Chinese companies like Huawei, TikTok and WeChat, China seeks to recalibrate its economy. A consumer-driven approach, a so-called internal circulation, would make more sense in the immediate term. Although China at the same time could keep doors open to investment and further open up the economy. Could this strategy work? What's the pros and cons and pitfalls of a more self-reliant economic approach? First up, my interview with Professor Zhu Ning about the fate of Chinese company and their aspirations of going global. Then will be followed by a panel discussion about the so-called dual circulations of the Chinese economy. Take a look. And joining me, Professor Zhu Ning in Beijing. Professor, welcome to the program. Nice you to tell here. me about your latest analysis about either TikTok and WeChat. How much potential they still have in the U.S. market? Well, I think there is still a lot of commercial potential. I mean, both in terms of connecting people and also providing some. Uh, a fresh form of entertainment and information to the mass market in the U.S. However, I think two things are highly uncertain right at the moment. One is what kind of reactions uh, U.S. government will have against Chinese uh, tech companies. And sometimes if you think of tech companies, you tend to think of Huawei or you tend to think of companies which are in some of the really sophisticated hardware industries. Mm -hmm. But now I think this range has expanded considerably over the past few months. And WeChat and TikTok, which are largely thought to be social network or social networking uh, uh, companies or uh, entertainment companies are now being included into tech companies as well. So I think this is some new development. Mm. Either Chinese tech companies or Chinese uh, social media platforms, as you just mentioned, the WeChat, TikTok, uh, uh, the aspiration of them have been going global uh, and also to serve various markets uh, with the uh, services they could have to adjust to different markets. But will that dream, that aspiration change as a result of geopolitics, at least temporarily? I, I think there is such a risk. I mean, let us not forget, I mean, every company, every ambitious company wants to be a global company, period. I think that is the aspiration of all great companies in a global period. And then for Chinese, I think it is even more so in a way that what well, China's international reach has grown uh, tremendously over the past decades. So I think those are just natural developments of not just Chinese companies, but, a, but companies which are going to succeed in this global period. And that being said, I think there is increasing uncertainties about, well, whether there is a difference in the uh, ideology, whether there's a difference in terms of how data are protected and stored, whether there is a, an agreement about how certain data can be used for certain purposes. So I think this is highly dynamic and we have to pay close attention to, I don't think anybody can give a definitive answer to this question at the moment. Mm. Professor Zhu, very unlikely in the near future, uh, discussions, serious discussions uh, with the results to come regarding national security, data security, uh, given the current uh, geopolitical environment. So uh, what are the best choices do you think? You've been doing research about Chinese global companies for long that these companies could have. Moving to London? Well, I think there are probably two general solutions. One is within the company's reach or grasp. The other is probably beyond. I think there should be some national level efforts I mean, from a Chinese government or from uh, NGOs trying to set, set up a uh, 
sort of third party, more independent entity, which can alleviate uh, the concerns, the reservations against Chinese companies. I think that does not happen with any particular company, but I think that is far broader to all Chinese companies which have global ambitions. Mm. And when it comes down to a specific company, I think there are probably two, maybe three things which uh, uh, companies like uh, WeChat and TikTok could consider. One, I think, is just the very broad uh, uh, lobbying efforts, which has been uh, implemented by all sorts of companies in the U.S., other international companies. And I think Chinese are not, or Chinese companies are not too familiar with this process. This is a fairly traditional and well-established channel for a company to communicate uh, its, its own message, its own vision to the U.S. public, to the U.S. legislature and U.S. administration. So I think that's, that's the first thing. Right. The second is there is always the legal resort. I think I mean, in the legal uh, system in the U.S., I think there's the separation of the powers gives a company, gives any citizen the right to lit litigate the government, litigate the administration if there's any wrongdoing or uh, breaking of the law. So I think this is also something I think Chinese companies would have to consider if worse comes to worse. Mm. And thirdly, I think eventually, uh, I think there's been increasing discussion about setting up the regional, maybe global headquarter outside China, setting up the data center outside of China, making the algorithm more transparent and more available to regulators in other countries. So I think that's also a compromise or maybe a, an inevitable middle step which Chinese companies would have to consider as well. Before we go, uh, Professor Zhu, uh, you've been doing research about Chinese tech companies. Uh, many pin big hope about that as a great potential for GDP growth and great potential about China's structural reform of its economy. So uh, under the current circumstances, how much hope can we still have about those fronts and potentials? I think I would still remain positive and optimistic uh, uh, for, for, for at least two reasons. One is there is still very big potential in Chinese domestic markets. So when we think of technology, I think it's no longer just the PC chips, it's not just the memory uh, cards. Uh, it's a much wider range of topics. It could be the provision of services, the, the so-called online offline, offline collaboration, which using the APP to enable better servicing and better integration of services into households uh, daily life. And there could also be the 5G, which as, I mean, even within China is a huge uh, undertaking and there is still a great business opportunity. So I think that part is still very promising. Even uh, many of the Chinese companies are growing at a slow pace outside China. The domestic Chinese market is still big enough to boost that part of the economy. So that's one. The second is, I think even if there is a con continuance of the U.S. administration, I think it's not clear that the U.S. has uh, already successfully formed the coalition. I think there are certain different uh, angles towards Chinese companies from different countries. Yes, in certain areas, maybe for TikTok, there's increasing agreement about certain things which have to be done. But for other companies, such as WeChat, such as Alipay, I think I mean, the, the disagreement is probably more so than the agreement for various countries. So I think it is not for sure at this mm. moment that all Chinese companies are going to face the same level of scrutiny or uh, opposition as TikTok did over the past months or so. And then with, I think, Chinese companies growing uh, their experience in handling such situations, I'm hopeful that Chinese companies, especially mm. the large technology companies, can become more versatile and can become more familiar with the process and navigate this process okay. far more smoothly and far more successfully. Well, certainly, Professor Zhu, you already gave uh, the uh, the best scenario and the worst scenario in your last remarks. Uh, I want to thank you for that. Uh, Professor Zhu Ning in Beijing, really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. That's Professor Zhu Ning with the latest development on TikTok, WeChat, and the tangle between China and the United States in the high-tech area. For more analysis about China's economy, we are bringing in a strong panel. Xu Tao in Beijing, chief economist from Deloitte, China. In New York, Anthony Chen, former J.P. Morgan Chase, chief economist. 
in Chiang Mai, Professor Jeffrey Townsend, Guanghua School of Management, Peking University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Many of the Chinese companies, as we mentioned in the earlier interview today uh, with another panelist, uh, has a lot to do with uh, developing globally, but uh, with geopolitics recently happening, particularly with China-related tech companies such as TikTok, uh, uh, WeChat, and many others, uh, there seems to be uh, a cold war going on, at least in the tech world, that the U.S. want to draw up uh, around the world. So, uh, Mr. Xu, China sees that as a rising potential of its growth uh, economy and internationalization. So what's going to happen when that part is becoming weakened, at least temporarily? Okay, first of all, um, every four years uh, we see this China bashing due to election uh, with 80 some days left. I'm sure more to come. But at the same time, we also have to recognize some structural trend taking place between China and the United States. And we also have to recognize um, tech rivalry, as you have just alluded. Mm. So what does it mean for Chinese companies? I think it means a few things. First of all, I think there's greater urgency for Chinese companies to be internationalized, to be more operating as a foreign company in the West. Um, on the national level, um, Chinese investment will be facing a greater scrutiny. Um, that also means maybe the government has to look into uh, industrial policy and the subsidy and the so on and so forth. And I think um, um, in the end, um, maybe this would add a catalyst for China to further open up its domestic market. So there will be uh, less justification on the ground so-called reciprocity for Western government to use Chinese company as collateral damage. Mm. Mr. Townsend? I think what you're seeing, at least on the U.S. side, but not limited to the U.S., because we hear similar situations in India, the U.K., Australia, Japan, is to, to some degree a resetting of the relationship that we've sort of gotten used to in the last 20 years. It has a trade aspect. Uh, it has a technology aspect, which is pretty complicated. And then I think in the last month, we've seen it sort of move into media and information, which is the TikTok story. And, you know, the, the two arguments you hear are national security, data privacy, and then you hear this idea of reciprocity. And I don't really hear a good counter argument to the reciprocity argument. If this is what you hear in the U.S. literally every day. Why should Chinese companies like TikTok, which is a media company, why should they be allowed when all the Western companies are banned in China? Why? And there's no great answer to that question. And so I think in that space, not all China tech companies, but the media ones are going to increasingly get faced by that question. And maybe, you know, we'll see the whole relationship change to what we've seen in the last 10 years. So yeah, maybe it could open up more in China, maybe it could shift down in the U.S. Well, it's a reset, probably overdue by about five years. Mm. A reset to a certain extent, uh, backed up by a mixture of uh, factors and reasons, political, economic, and, and you mentioned it. Uh, Mr. Chen, whether a country has a plan, that's one thing, and whether the circumstances in the world allows its plan to be implemented is another thing, and that applies to any country, any economy. So uh, once again, what do you make of, under current circumstances, uh, the so-called dual circulation? Uh, which part of the dual circulation, the internal or the external, likely will be the future of the story? I think the future has to involve both the external and the internal. Because in order to grow, I think you have to have cooperation. I think the basic laws of economics tell you uh, that uh, when you have the uh, large economies uh, operating, uh, they have to cooperate. And so that decoupling, I think, uh, uh, of, or even a resetting, as, as was mentioned, these are uh, practical measures in order to survive over the near term. Mr. Chu uh, made, a, made a very good point, and that is that over time, in order to succeed, uh, countries will, in fact, uh, have to listen to the complaints that are being made. 
China, I think, has already uh, been listening. Uh, certainly, when I started going to China some 25 years ago, we didn't we saw uh, more joint ventures uh, with uh, Chinese companies holding a majority. And now there are some financial companies in China that actually can have more than 50% ownership and even larger. So we are going to see uh, these companies, uh, U.S. companies operating uh, in China with more freedom. And hopefully that will also mean that when the United States sees that, they will have less reason to argue uh, that Chinese companies cannot do the same thing in the United States. After all, uh, if China is opening up, uh, the United States has no other uh, option but to also do the same thing. And of course, uh, as elections come up, uh, you obviously have to campaign and, and there's going to be a lot of uh, politics that dictate uh, relationships between uh, China and the United States. But I focus more on what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years, not what happens uh, uh, three or four months before every presidential election. Mr. Chu, uh, what do you think about, as the second largest economy in the world, the responsibilities and the also close operations China should have about the other economies, how they are doing? Um, China has a lot of responsibilities. First of all, um, there are still many low-income countries, emerging market, uh, struggling with debt. Uh, I think China could definitely um, uh, provide more support in terms of debt relief. Uh, number two, on COVID-19, this is a common enemy faced by China, United States, and everyone. So that's a um, so so China can definitely provide public goods. E vaccine is being developed in China first. Uh, thirdly, um, China can do a lot by integrating its economy into the global economy. Just give you a few data points. And with trade war in the past two years, right now the average tariff between China and United States is around twenty percent. The average tariff between China and the European countries around 10%. Mm -hmm. But the average tariff between China and ASEAN countries almost zero. So China can definitely uh, reduce tariff. China can definitely take the leadership by wrapping up RCEP and even one day joining the newer version of TPP. Uh, Mr. Xu, China has been talking about two circulations, so called inner circulation and the external circulation help us to understand what exactly China has in mind uh, according to your reading. Uh, sometime in May, uh, Chinese government uh, flesh out this notion of internal circulation is really about greater role of domestic demand. Uh, in June and July, uh, additional uh, concept of dual circulation was being unveiled that's suggesting Chinese government still wants to uh, 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 wants to be engaged, uh, integrated with global economy. Um, so to emphasize, external demand remains important. Therefore, in my opinion, dual circulation is a, not about a closed door policy; is more a temporary technical move mm. against the backdrop of slow global economic recovery. I see. Professor Townsend, your take. Yeah, I mean, definitely this is not out of line with just general GDP growth. We've, we've seen China for a long time sort of slowly shifting its focus from external exports more to domestic demand. But then you have to kind of look at the backdrop of what we're going on right now with the world economy sort of bouncing all over. Plus, you have the U.S.-China dispute, which began with trade, then it moved to tech, now it's more in media. So I think in addition to this whole idea of how do you grow in a stable form, domestic versus international, there's this issue of dependency, where countries, particularly the U.S. and China, are less comfortable being overly dependent on one each other, but probably external factors as well. So I think there's a lot of dependency playing out here as well. Mm. Let's be a little more independent than we used to be. I see. COVID-19 coupled with geopolitics and also uh, various uncertainties in the international market and challenges 
lead China to the current decision about so-called dual circulation. But when we talk about the internal circulation, it's very much about gearing up the demand, as Professor uh, Townsend and Mr. Xu mentioned. But how much demand can be geared up? China has a lot going for it in its quest to tap into consumer power. China held on to a strong industrial production capacity so far, coupled with more than 100 million market players and over 170 million talents. It has more than 400 million middle-income residents. In short, China can support a domestic demand-oriented development model, some argue. But that, of course, is not going to be feasible if a country closed its door uh, willingly, you know, voluntarily. Uh, under the current circumstances, though, uh, Mr. Chan, uh, it seems to be understandable. China has uh, quite a bit of potential to grow. Uh, as you probably know, the middle class uh, makes up a, a significant share of the economy. But uh, when you look at uh, those groups that are earning uh, less than middle income uh, salaries, uh, it is quite significant. Uh, so in fact, uh, even larger than, than the so-called middle income uh, individuals. Uh, and some people might view that as a disadvantage. I actually think it's an advantage because it really tells you that there is an opportunity for growth. Mm. Unlike in the United States, uh, consumption spending is a, is a lot smaller in China as a percentage of the economy. So as they move towards uh, emphasizing consumer spending, I think it, op it offers the opportunity for a lot of growth. I know, Mr. Xu, you are here in Beijing. Uh, I'm sure you have similar impressions when you are walking into the streets now in a city like Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan, uh, Chongqing, uh, that people are coming out. Uh, it's almost coming back to the original hustle bustle of a metropolitan city except uh, uh, traveling uh, between and among provinces and municipalities. Uh, Mr. Xu, what is your personal take about the reality? Well, the personal take around here actually uh, travel has resumed. Mm. I think the economy is more than on the mend. Second quarter growth of 3.2% is not a flash of hand. In my opinion, um, third quarter, fourth quarter, the growth very much likely to be above trend. Let's say the trend growth is 5%. So we could easily 7% in second half year. So that would put the whole year growth comfortably around 3%. Mm. So this is a Chinese economy. But today's session is about boosting consumption. Yeah. So given strong recovery momentum we are seeing. And given earlier than expected recovery of Western powerhouses, I would advocate the policy shift in second half to more gear towards consumers and the small and medium-sized enterprises. Right. If you travel around China, Mr. Townsend, you know this very well. You've been living in China for a long time, even though now you are based in Chiang Mai. I hope you can come back soon uh, to Beijing. Uh, <laughs> having said that, though, you notice here in China, uh, beer fest in Qingdao, uh, you know, rock concerts. Uh, you see also large-scale conferences with more than 1,000 people, some of them wearing masks, some of them don't. And you see the numbers of confirmed cases uh, not those coming into China, but those from China, is zero. Uh, so uh, these signs are giving people more hope about further opening up economy. But the question is, how about the speed of opening up the economy, the uncertainty of COVID-19 still hanging in the cloud? And meanwhile, trying to do what you call the, to boost the domestic consumption. Yeah, I mean, China really has done I think mentally China has done well in just sort of adapting to the situation. And I mean, I'm from the U.S. and I, I don't think there is the realization yet that, look, this is probably something we just have to manage on an ongoing basis. It ain't going away anytime soon. We just learn to live with it. We protect ourselves and such. Mm. Uh, and in that sense, I think China came back relatively quickly. People started going out again. Domestic travel started out fairly quickly in China. Uh, and that actually works out quite well somewhere. I got stuck in Thailand <laughs> when this happened. And the country is very dependent on foreign tourism, which is not coming back anytime soon, particularly from China. 
So in that sense, I mean, you can see sort of domestic China just sort of getting on with life. Uh, to some degree, I think faster than other countries have done that, uh, which is interesting. And, you know, the cases will come and go. And it just, viruses have always been with us. Mm. We don't usually, you know, I'm a doctor by background. We don't usually fix viruses or cure them. We just learn to live with them. Mr. Chen, there's much more complexity than just what China decides to do because it's an uh, ever-evolving situation internationally. Besides COVID-19 geopolitics, there's also about international trade, about how the international government system is likely to run in the future regarding trade and economic exchanges among countries, so uh, global supply chains as well. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chen, how do you see all of these uh, piled up and having its impact on China's policy-making process? Well, I think that uh, global supply chains uh, won't be the same uh, 12 months from now or 36 months from now. There certainly will be an attempt uh, to diversify those global uh, supply chains uh, on the belief that uh, a lack of diversification means increased risk. Uh, that is not even something against China. It's against uh, almost any country, yeah. whether all the production, uh, when all the production is focused on one location, if something goes wrong, there's a problem. So we are going to see some sort of uh, diversification of those global supply chains. And that will be healthy. That will be healthy for, for the global economy. I want to thank all of you for uh, providing clues about uh, what the future could be like, at least uh, for a better version. Uh, Xu Zitao, Anthony Chen, Jeffrey Townsend, thank you so much. All the best. Be safe where you are. And you're watching World Insights. Still to come on our program. People to people relations built on song and dance. Uh, earlier, I sat down with Kevin Worthen, who is the president of the BYU. We started our conversation back in 1979 when he was still a BYU student who heard about the tour to China from his friends on campus. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. Let's continue our special series, Pathfinder. As the current U.S. administration plays up protectionism against the global consensus, China and U.S. ties are under the greatest strain. In times of political uncertainty, it is important that people-to-people -people exchanges remain vibrant. It was in 1979 when China and the U.S. went full steam ahead with diplomatic ties. That same year, a couple of college students from Brian Young University became one of the first American entertainers to perform in China. For Chinese audiences, it was something new and exciting, and for the young American performers, China was completely exotic and fascinating at the time. Since then, the Utah Private University had done more than 30 tours in China over the years, making a name for itself among the Chinese. Marking the four decades of ties and friendship, the university brought its largest show yet to the stage in Beijing last year. Earlier, I sat down with Kevin Worthen, who is the president of the BYU. We started our conversation back in 1979 when he was still a BYU student who heard about the tour to China from his friends on campus. What was it like, the very first performance of Brigham Young in China at Hong Ta Theater in downtown Beijing? Well, I was not present at that time. I know, I, you I were very actually, young at the time. I, actually, I was a student at BYU at the time. You were? I was. Okay. And uh, had grown up in an era in which there had been no diplomatic relationships between the People's Republic of China and the United States. So it was quite newsworthy when this group from Brigham Young University had the opportunity to come to Beijing and perform. And uh, it turned out to be one that, that is remembered very well on campus. Since that time, students hear the stories of the impact that was had. I wondered about those stories myself, <laughs> how true they were. Over time, some stories get exaggerated. What were those stories? You're making me really curious. Yeah, it was about how, how students or people in China would see on CCTV mm -hmm. looping Thanks reruns. for mentioning our name. Yes, <laughs> would see reruns of, of the performers from BYU early in, 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 in the early years after they had been here and how influenced they were to think of one of the great universities of, of the United States was BYU, was Brigham Young University. And I came to China three years ago for my first visit. And I visited with various people who were about my age or a little bit younger, 
many of them confirmed the stories that they too <laughs> had this image of Brigham Young University and of the United States because of the, of the group that had come here. 1970s, the end of 1970s, when the Chinese, almost all of them either in blue or in green or on bicycles, watched this performance of girls being thrown around in the air, you know, singing a very different way coming from the U.S., uh, so different from the revolutionary songs. Have you ever imagined what it was like for the Chinese? I'm sure when the students came coming back from China, they must have been talking. Well, the one thing that, that, that I heard mostly was how warmly received they were by the people who, again, spoke a different language, came from a different culture, at the time viewed for many of their lifetimes as almost a, not only foreigner but, but, but enemies, so to speak. And that they were not that different than, than people may have thought from what we were. And now I'm with four of them coming from Brigham Young University dancing and singing troupe. I'm Skylar Hunter. I'm from California. Uh, so I'm on the dunk team, the basketball <laughs> dunking acrobatic team. My name is Abby Bench. I am from Utah. I'm on the Cougarettes, which is the dance team at Brigham Young University. I'm Hannah Daly and from Utah studying music dance theater. Jansen Daly, we're actually married. Yes. Oh, are you? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm on vocal point, so we're uh, an eight man a cappella group. <laughs> coming into a country different from yours, how did your parents and friends see this? They were thrilled. They couldn't be more proud. My parents, I think, are excited and a little bit jealous that yeah. we're living in China. Um, not only with all of the sightseeing we've been able to do, but um, with our show as well, and even just walking the streets of Beijing and, and meeting people um, dancing on the streets and the festival that's going. <laughs> yeah, we were um, <laughs> dancing with some of the locals out here that we just just met walking around, yeah. and um, it's been great to connect our cultures. And yeah. so we were in the park. They were yeah. there was one. That they were doing this. And they came here. <laughs> came <the> back around. <laughs> and, oh, that was just great. They're just they're just so willing to to teach us, and yeah. they're excited to see us, and we're excited to to learn their. They're dancing, I guess they're post-supper dancing. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there are so many things going on between China and the United States, uh, in the media, you know, in politics. And therefore, people see your performance here in China with an extra layer of significance. Mm. Do you also see it that way? Um, yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of things going on, but mostly what we want to do is just show people that you know, we're all connected yeah. and that uh, we all have things in common and there's no better way to do that than, in my opinion, than through music and through dance and, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's really our goal and uh, we've just loved going out on the streets and meeting uh, the Chinese people and we haven't performed for an audience yet but we're, uh, we're excited to make the connection in that way. <laughs>
<laughs> you think about it, President Wilson. You know, Brigham Young University coming from the state of Utah. This almost has nothing to do with politics in a way. And also so far away, just to look at the name of the state from China. Um, but how come it was one of the really real pioneers in linking the two people together? Very important bridge. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is there is a, a shared value system in terms of the importance of education, the importance of families, and that's something that people in Utah and at Brigham Young University, those two things are, are deeply part of the culture. The other is within, again, the culture of, of the university and its sponsoring organization, a deep-seated commitment to the cultural arts, music, uh, dance. The early pioneers who arrived in Utah, when they were barely surviving, just eking out a living, uh, quickly built what were called cultural halls. And even though they were just trying to make a living, it was important for them to have music and culture even in the early uh, uh, years that they were there in, in Utah. You emphasize once and again, President Worthen, about common humanity from the very beginning of our conversation. But now, as you may know, there are a lot of people talking about maybe we should go first, our interests, while others, we'll just see. Um, of course, there are very different views from around the world about this. What do you make of it? When you were interacting with the students as an educator, what kind of picture are you trying to present to them? And what kind of picture do you think is in their best interests? Well, I think that the, their, their best interests are served by understanding what we believe as a people, as a university, as I say, as our sponsoring church, that each human being is literally created in the image of our heavenly parents. And that, that each human being has the potential then for it that is much beyond what most people think. And that, that while each of us has our own particular flaws, each also has within us the ability to do extraordinary things. And that that's how they should view people, where, whatever they're at in their station in life, whatever the situation of the people. That's why as I, I do emphasize the common humanity to say we are all not only have things in common, but have great potential, greater potential than most of us realize. You are a constitutional lawyer. Uh, of course, you look at things from a different perspective, but now you are president of Brigham Young. Uh, culture exchanges is an important part of Brigham Young University and tradition. So what do you make of this very different tracks of thinking? How things are being put into perspectives? How far are we from the real pictures? It's a really good question and one that's probably always timely to ask because context shifts, political winds shift, uh, there's, there's sometimes tension, sometimes agreement, and I think part of the thing that I've seen in, 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 in law, the study of law, is how temporary law and politics are in many ways. Mm -hmm. That people's common humanity and relationships can endure even though there are tensions, even though there are disagreements. And those get resolved in various ways, legally and politically and in other ways. But there is, again, a, a common bond of humanity and relationships that can endure even beyond and during those times when it may be more intention. But you know, Mr. President, before we go, there are genuine concerns and worries about two great countries, China and the United States. Where are we going from here? whether we are leaving a better future and a better potential for the next generation, or this generation gonna fail the next few generations. President Worthen, as an educator, as a constitutional lawyer, as someone who got to know the exotic China more than for more than 40 years, what do you think? I'm optimistic about the future. Really? Where is yes. that optimism based on? Based on p part of our past experience, I'll use as one example just to, to what we talked about. If you look at what's happened to both China and, and, and Brigham Young University in the last 40 years, it's been remarkable. I don't think either would have predicted, and particularly uh, there's, there's one member of the, of, of, of the group here, Randy Booth, who was there in the very beginning in 1979, now here again 40 years later and to hear him describe the differences in China. It was a much different, just visually, 
uh, everything else than it was before. And I think that's part of the optimism. But part of it is just, again, the, the, the belief in the potential for people to, to, to do good and, and to make wise choices. They don't always do that. And there have been some travesties that have happened. But I think, again, the more people can see the common humanity in each other, I come back to that theme, the, the, the more optimistic I am. And programs like this allow that kind of, of, uh, of, of vision, that kind of perspective to see other people who are different, who speak a different language, come from a different culture, but to see that they share in common, in this case, music and, and, and dancing and, and everything else that is kind of a, uh, resonates with anyone regardless of their, and, and that gives me optimism saying people can still connect at a very deep level, even though the politics around them may be trying to divide them. President Wharton from the Brahim Young University, which sent the first group of entertainers from America to China after the two countries normalized diplomatic relations. Well, that's all the time we have for today for our Pathfinder series. If you'd like to see more of our program, search World Insight. That's the program name. And also you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and our YouTube channel. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.